Hello, thank you for tuning in to Radio Maria 91.3 FM. It is now time for Side by Side, where we discuss issues relating to conflict, peace, and security. I am Reverend Father Robert Achiaga. We are joined today in the studio by two very special guests. We have Professor Taiwo Abiyoye. She is a former Deputy Vice Chancellor of Covenant University, a research fellow at Luke's Terra Leadership Foundation. You are welcome, Professor. Thank you. And Dr. Noel Ihebuzo is not a stranger to our listeners. He's a former lecturer, a public and social policy professional with many years of experience consulting with UNICEF, the World Health Organization, UNESCO, the Institute for Peace at The Hague, and uh, many others. You are welcome, sir. Well, thank you for that. Now, the topic uh, we shall be discussing on the show today is promoting tolerance in our educational institutions. Our guests will help us unpack this topic. But before we get started, let us take a look at some headlines of interest. Let's begin with uh, the foreign headlines. Uh, first, Sweden, Finland to submit NATO membership bid Wednesday. Uh, there is also this headline that says, McDonald's has said it will permanently leave Russia after more than 30 years and has started to sell its restaurants. Uh, where well, you need some details on that because it is about the impact of the Russia-Ukraine uh, conflict. So, McDonald's first, the first restaurant, uh, Ma McDonald's first restaurant in Russia was opened in Moscow in 1990, following the end of the Cold War, as the Soviet Union was opening its economy to the Western world. The fast food giant said it made the decision because of the humanitarian crisis. And on, it made the decision because of the humanitarian crisis and unpredictable operating environment caused by the Ukraine war. The move, which affects uh, its 850 outlets in Russia, will put 62,000 employees out of job. Now, Dr. Noel, uh, this is another sphere of uh, the impact of the invasion of uh, um, Russia, uh, the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. Uh, we have seen different aspects of uh, the consequences of this invasion, but this story is about how it is beginning to impact uh, the world of jobs. Uh, 62,000 people are going to lose their jobs, the 850 outlets of um, McDonald's were shut down. And this will definitely affect uh, the livelihoods uh, of uh, people around these uh, outlets. Yeah, um, very true. The thing is, once uh, somebody uh, said that uh, war was politics by other means, now suddenly now it's beginning to look like economics is war by other means. And essentially the move by um, um, McDonald's is trying to put pressure indirectly on the uh, Russian administration to think twice because no, the decision they are taking has, effect, has impacts that go beyond their relationship with Ukraine. So what is the, the whole end, end game here is to create a massive unemployment such that will lead to disaffection by significant portions of the Russian working class, such that will then um, provoke clamorings and such that will eventually push um, uh, uh, Putin to review his stand. Now the thing is, this is built on an assumption of domino, a domino effect in politics. That what a decision taken here is going to keep cascading and falling and causing other things to fall. I 
I agree, I can see the merit in it. But like they said, the devil is in the detail. I'd want to know whether indeed the transfer of ownership, who does McDonald's sell to? Is it a franchise? Is it disengaging completely? Or is it, again, trying to look good in the public eye Why is transferring ownership to a proxy? But whatever it is, this is a decision that's going to have long-lasting repercussions on the Russian economy because it's going to, it's going to tell the, Russian, the Russians that no decision you take is cost-free. Every decision has a cost. And hopefully it will make Putin think twice about further aggressions. What I notice is that as uh, accounts of the story of the war keep coming in, that the war, the, the theaters of war are, are gradually being redefined. Yes. Are, are gradually being redefined. And this pressure, he could yield, Putin could yield to it by just saying, okay, I'm going to stop where I am now. Because at a tactical level, apart from the um, non-performance of his forces, he's been able to achieve a lot of his objectives in this crisis. But I think that uh, McDonald sends a very powerful message to the administration, and they will think twice before getting, uh, before moving on. Thank I you. agree with you. Um, obviously, it is not only McDonald's that uh, has shut down operations in Russia. Coca-Cola shut down operations since March. Netflix uh, is out of operations, and a host of other companies, especially those uh, owned by uh, Western uh, organizations. Uh, the interesting thing about McDonald's is they say they will continue. They are, all, they are working on continuing paying the, the salaries of these 62,000 employees until when they will be able to sell the company. But, uh, Professor Abiyo, uh, I am worried because um, the shutting down of these uh, companies means uh, loss of jobs. The economy of Russia has already been impacted by sanctions. If uh, in Nigeria, where you don't, uh, Nigeria has not been uh, in a war situation, and yet companies have been leaving Nigeria, you know. So if we have to have a grade of insecurity that comes close to what is going on in Ukraine, how really bad will it be? Thank you, Father. Um, I want to say that it's going to be very bad because um, right now we have issues of insecurity, kidnapping, and all kinds of things. So if uh, a big name like McDonald's is pulling out of Russia, then it means that uh, in Nigeria, we we'll have so many big names. The other time, we were, we were told that uh, ShopRite was selling, uh -huh, was selling out, and um, in a, an indigenous uh, company took over. And um, I'm not very sure how that worked out, but then, by the time such things happen in Nigeria, it's going to be bad because already the, the um, insecurity in the society, the unpredictability in operations and everything, today the trains are on, tomorrow uh, passengers, are, passengers are being kidnapped, and then you cannot pass through a particular road, you know, and uh, all these issues, it will make it worse in Nigeria. And uh, that's why I think that um, uh, we pray that it does not get to that level. Yeah, we really pray uh, mm. it doesn't get to that level. But we first have to work on it. <laughs> okay, back home in Nigeria, we also followed uh, some headlines. And the first is, of course, about Deborah Yakubo, who was murdered in a most gruesome manner. This one says, Deborah, police declare fleeing suspects in viral video wanted. That's uh, a bit worrisome, but we'll move to the next one. Mm -hmm. So the second headline, still about Deborah Yakubo. It says, 
Senior advocate of Nigeria asks Sokoto governor to resign over watery charges against suspected killers. Uh, Dr. Noel, let's take uh, some more details on this one. The senior advocate, advocate of Nigeria in question is Ebun Olu Adeborua. In a message on his Facebook page titled The Conspiracy in Sokoto, Adeborua wrote, the criminal charge of criminal conspiracy and inciting public disturbance as framed by the Sokoto state government against hardened murderers is an insult to the sensibilities of the parents of the deceased, the people of Nigeria, and God who created Deborah. This crime took place in an enlightened environment, in a higher institution, under the watch of security men who were said to have been overpowered. It all started from a WhatsApp group which has identified leaders. There are students who sent messages and threats of death on that platform. Their phone numbers are registered with NIN identification. They belong to a class in the school so they are known individuals. Images of persons who openly and boastfully confessed of partaking in the murder abound, with one displaying the matchstick with which the deceased was set ablaze. He also wrote, It is most uncharitable of His Excellency to have condoned this baseless charge. It is better to set the suspects free rather than claim to try them. The aftermath of this gruesome murder, the watery charges filed and the consenting attitude of those concerned have depressed me more than the act itself. Nigeria cannot work this way at all. I'm truly saddened by this development. Uh, this is uh, the senior advocate of Nigeria, Debo Rua. Mm. He is saddened that the charges that were announced in court uh, to him, they didn't even come close to what the whole world witnessed there. If somebody was murdered, stoned, beaten, burned, and in the court you're charging the person for uh, criminal, criminal conspiracy, conspiracy and inciting public disturbance, for him that is an insult to the family, to Nigerians, to the world, and to God who created the borough. Yes, I think that um, we often hear people say in Nigeria, let justice be done. But I think one of the greatest injustices is to frame charges in such watery and loophole manners that the accused manages to extricate himself with a list of effort. And this is what we've specialized in in this country. You see somebody who has killed somebody, there's a visual evidence of the act there's a, there's a hearing evidence of the intention. There's a, a actual view of the act itself. So the two elements of criminality, mens rea and actus reus, as they say in law, are present. The intention to do the evil and the actual evil done, you have concrete and hard evidence of them. But rather than charge the person with that act itself, you now charge him with a lesser act because and which will be more difficult to prove because conspiracy to do something is you, you the onus of proof is now on the, the, the lawyer on the other side to say, I can show concrete evidence that I saw when you were conspiring. These are the stages in the conspiracy. These are your fellow, I, I mean, it's, it's a bit like a plot from um, uh, Julius Caesar. So that you now want, rather than saying Cassius or Brutus, you want to charge all the 12 who are involved in the killing of Caesar. I think it's a rather unfortunate way to, to treat the dead. We, there, is a, there, there is a need, without entering into the merits of a case currently, there's a need for justice to be done. And by passing justice through being clever by half is a very unfortunate thing to do in this country. And, and we've done it repeatedly. And because people know that there's that avenue, there's a climate of impunity that is building around because then when you now commit the act, all you have to do is to look for a clever lawyer, huh? 
who can compromise a few people, and then charges where you can easily extricate yourself from, are then thrown against you. And remember that once you've been charged and acquitted, next time you're taken to court, there's a charge, there's, 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 there's an application called Otrufwa Acquit. Otrufwa Acquit means I've been tried for this crime and I've been acquitted. So in many cases, we do this deliberately. And for I think the other insult is that, that they, they lead criminalists on the run. Where, where, how did they run? Where is he running from? I mean, the joke now in this country is that I know I'm running to the state house. Sorry, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, I, I don't think that's where the person is running he, I, to. I don't think he's running to uh, mm -hmm. uh, the state. But how did he escape? So that, that's quite, I mean, on, on a ladder of responsibility, on a network of criminality and a network of complicity, there are too many people involved in this and will not get justice by being mealy mouthed about this or by actually compromising standards or ethics or rules of good judgment. Yes, uh, you talked about uh, lawyers who come to the defense of uh, people like that. Yes, uh, even if someone were caught in uh, the most dastardly form of crime, they are entitled to a lawyer. But the case of Deborah, uh, is particularly interesting because uh, over 34 lawyers we are reading showed up uh, in her defense. Well, what uh, the senior advocate of Nigeria said seems to be in tandem with the position of the Nigeria Bar Association. So we have this next headline, Deborah. NBA asks Sokoto to file charges that reflect gravity of the situation. Again, uh, Dr. No, you had mentioned that uh, this is uh, not just an insult to the parents. It's an insult to also procedures. But um, uh, it's interesting to mention on this show that the mother of Deborah has spoken. Yeah. And uh, the family doesn't want anything about court. So they have a certain sense of justice in whereby... Uh, justice can be gotten in the presence of God. And whatever happens on earth here, they don't want to get themselves involved in. It looks like they have surrendered to the will of God and we move on from there. Um, let's take the next um, headline. This one says, Blasphemy. Don't kill Naomi Goni. Murik warns Muslims. This is another case of blasphemy alleged blasphemy. So let's take a few details on these uh, headlines. The Muslim rights concern Murik has intervened in another blasphemy saga in Boruno State where a student of Ramat Polytechnic, Meiduguri, Naomi Goni, was alleged to have insulted the prophet of Islam. Professor Ishaka Kintola, director of Murik, issued a statement in which he said, and I quote him, one Abdul Majid Tanko is gay, who is leading the allegation against her, said in his post, there is a gay named Naomi Goni who insulted the messenger of Allah, peace be upon him. And in Islam, it is a death sentence, even if it is a Muslim. We therefore call on the Borno state government to take immediate action or else we Muslims will not sleep and we will take action. It is well known in Sharia, continues the director of Murik, in Sharia circles in Nigeria, that a Christian cannot be taken to a Sharia court unless he or she expressly opts for it. Christians can only be charged to the conventional court, common law court. That is why Muslims of Borno State must allow the police to handle the case of Naomi Goni. She is a Christian, and the security agencies are there to handle her if it is true that she has committed blasphemy. Muslims must stop issuing death threats concerning this case because the, that creates the impression that we are living in a lawless society and that we have no respect for the rule of law. Murik calls on Islamic scholars in Borno 
to follow due process. There should be proper guidance and tutelage for our youths. We should allow the police to investigate the matter. The youths should also repose confidence in the state government. I think this is a wonderful and timely intervention from Murik. Mm. First of all, they condemn the attempt to take laws into mm. one's hands. And then, very importantly, they clarify that even if there is a case of blasphemy, a Christian, by even Islamic laws, is not to be tried in a Sharia court. It is a civil court. He says, except the Christian concerned, ought to be tried there. Messages like this are consoling, aren't they? Mm, they are indeed so. Madam, what do you think? Um, I believe that um, it's uh, what they have said is actually right. And uh, it is also topical because of what is going on. And... Um, it is also a strong uh, 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 human, uh, Islamic human rights group, so they know what they are saying, and they are saying that uh, even if a case is established, which it has, it has not been established, mm -hmm. even if the case is established, it is not right to try a Christian the Sharia way. So I, I, I agree with them, and uh, if people can listen to what they are saying, it will be good so that we don't descend into anarchy and lawlessness. People take the law into their hands. They do all kinds of things. And uh, I'm surprised because uh, the Sultanate has condemned what has happened. Uh, uh, then the Amuric also and several other Islamic organizations have condemned what has happened. If only these people can listen to what the others are saying, uh, it, it would be good because you cannot just go about uh, uh, pronouncing death sentences on people on, the, on uh, cases of uh, alleged, I say alleged because in law it is still alleged, alleged uh, uh, blasphemy. So uh, it is not proper for people to take the law into their hands. Monday on this show we, uh, we had uh, Sheikh uh, Nuru Khalid mm -hmm. and uh, explaining what blasphemy is about, what Islamic, what true Islamic teaching about blasphemy is. You recognize that uh, in Nigeria, uh, messages like these come with quite some courage. And so this is commendable. It has to be said mm. on this show. Mm. Mm. Okay, let's take the next uh, headline. This one says, Aviation Authority warns pilots, airlines, over hazardous weather. This is about environmental security, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we pray that uh, clemency in the world of uh, weather will be favorable. And you cannot be too careful. We have lost too many lives. Mm -hmm. So whenever we are able to take precautionary measures to protect lives and save ourselves from uh, unnecessary tears, uh, that should be done. We also have another headline that says, Eight killed. 32 vehicles burnt in Southeast Bloody Monday. Well, this, uh, the states involved are actually Imo State, Anambra State, and Inugu State. In Imo State, uh, there was a confrontation between uh, gunmen and uh, security forces. And uh, we understand about eight people, or uh, was it six, were left dead. Uh, f resulting from that consultation. In Anambra State, it was also uh, a, a, a confrontation between security forces and uh, armed men. But in Inugu State, um, some facilities were uh, invaded and then uh, I think electricity, an electricity company, I, I, I think so, and uh, they burnt down many vehicles that are supposed to be used by the company, you know, and that is really, really sad. We have always discussed um, insecurity, especially in the Southeast on this uh, show. And we have always appealed to people in the Southeast to recognize that the destruction of public property is of great consequence, both to those who are destroying it 
and those who are not involved in it. Mm -hmm. The reason is, this property is bought with taxpayers' money. And if it has to be replaced, it will still be with taxpayers' money. Mm -hmm. yeah. You can see that our security, uh, uh, the budget, the, the aspect of our budget that should go to security has been increasing over the years. And because of that increment, money that should be available for health, for education, for infrastructure, gets moved into security. So if we continue to become security challenges to our regions, to our states, to our communities, to the whole country, it means we are going to be starved of other aspects of uh, development, aren't we? Mm -hmm. No, you see, the thing is that uh, the problem in the southeast or in the, in the Igbo-speaking states now is becoming an embarrassment to everybody. Um, you declare work-free days, no movement days and all that. And then you now want to enforce it on everybody. I mean, the, the model, uh, let me, uh, uh, the model I want to give is that when uh, Gandhi decided on a boycott of cotton or, dre or materials from the UK, he did not carry, his followers did not carry guns to shoot people who were wearing gowns from the UK. It was an appeal to conscience. If you believe in this line of action, if you believe that this boycott will result in the change we want to do, engineer, then act it, but you are not under, nobody is putting a gun to your head. Show belief and show commitment by voluntary action. The same thing with Rosa Parks in, um, in, in, the, in the US. The decision to avoid buses, go off the buses, I mean, a few black people rode on those buses on those days. Nobody was there carrying a, a, a rifle, and in a country like America, that's infested with guns. Nobody was carrying guns to enforce that. But the thing was that if you believe in the, uh, the, the functionality of that approach, then you'll join us, but let there be no compulsion. In matters of belief, in matters of action to change a corrupt system, my thinking is let there be no compulsion. But what has happened here is that a number of people with pent up aggression, without direction, without leadership, are now competing for who gets into the public space, into the public domain, because each time it happens, it's reported, and then perhaps through a very egregious type of thinking, you're rising in, 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 in the ladder of, of, of some, the, some kind of outbidding. Yes. So I, I think that we should be very careful because you destroy things, those things will be, destroyed, will be replaced with... But then there are things you destroy which can never be replaced. Human lives can never be replaced. Yes. And you can't put a value on a destroyed human life. You can't. Mm -hmm. And so my, my appeal to those people, to people, is that pursue your cause, but don't kill people in the... In the, in the, in the in, I mean, here, I think that the words of Jonathan, for once, or in my political uh, career, the what no cause is worth a human life or the, the human blood. Mm. Yes, you have a grievance. Yes, you think you have a sense of entitlement. Yes, you think you've been wronged. But please, do that without pursue that cause without sacrificing lives, without creating mayhem, without uh, engaging in massive destruction of property. And above all, it should be very clear to those you claim to be speaking for, yes. that you're really doing it for their mm -hmm. own good. good. Such that when they begin to say, we are no longer at ease, you should reckon that they are really not at ease. Uh, Professor Abiyo, there is this headline here that is quite positive and uh, we we'll need to take a look at it. It says, federal government orders resumption of Abuja Kaduna train service. Okay, so more details. In a statement on Monday signed by the spokesperson of the Nigerian Railway Corporation, NRC, Yakubu Mahmoud, 
The federal government said service on the Abuja Kaduna route, which was suspended since terrorists attacked a train, fatally shot several persons, and abducted scores of passengers in March, will resume on May 23. Part of the statement reads, and I quote, the government wishes to reassure the relatives of the abducted citizens still in captivity that the self safe rescue of these passengers is a top priority and not to misconstrue the resumption of train services as abandonment or nonchalant attitude of the government towards their plight. The federal government will never abdicate its responsibility in rescuing these valuable citizens. However, the government assures of its resolve not to succumb to threats by any faceless group. According to the statement, additional security measures being put in place to beef up security at the train stations and along the track include requesting for passengers' national identification numbers, NIN, valid photo identification card, and reachable telephone numbers of next of kin or close relative before boarding a train. Uh, now, Professor Biri, why this is a cheering um, statement, uh, I must underline the fact that government recognizes that the resumption of train services on this route, if not properly explained, could give the impression that uh, the state has moved on from the whole question of how to rescue those under captivity. And it is good that this was uh, underlined in this statement, right? Yes. Um, what I see about this is that um, it appears as if uh, government is not that serious because this has happened for some time now. Since March. Yes, and um, the people are still held captive. The relations of the people that have been kidnapped cannot overlook it. There is no way you can explain, if I were one of them, there's no way you can explain to me to say that uh, uh, government is working on it. I will not believe it because uh, it, is, uh, it is a general knowledge that the Nigerian government can do whatever it wants to do, if it wants to do it. So why is it taking so long? Because the longer these people stay in, cap in uh, captivity, the uh, more they lose hope about regaining their freedom. Now, government wants to resume uh, the train services. What other measures have they put in place? Is it uh, just asking for name? asking for next of kin, uh, that's, one, that's one to me who is not enough. I find your question interesting because uh, the Minister for Transportation, uh, Right Honorable Rotimi Amici, uh, on the heels of this uh, attack, had said if their proposal to have um, uh, security cameras along the track and also on the train was approved and the cameras uh, uh, installed, it could have forestalled this. The question is, now that they are resuming, do we say that that has been done? Because he seems to be very sure that if that major had been taken, the attack could have been forestalled. So many Nigerians will be wondering, now that we are resuming, has that been done? Just to stress the, the importance of your question. Thank you. Yeah, Father, I think the other, the, other, the other worrying thing is that, like Prof has said, asking for names and identification possibilities is not security. It's just, it's like telling us, in case another kidnap mm -hmm. happens, <laughs> we now have a more valid way to identify the victims. I mean, so it's like government saying, oh, we, our response to this is to make sure that next time there's a kidnap, mm -hmm. we are up and running and able to provide the names of those provided, uh, kidnapped, the name, name numbers and all that. No, that's not yes. security. Mm -hmm. What is security is ensuring, monitoring the whole of that rail track, having a response that will able to descend 
on any on, on any attack in the shortest possible time. And here I'm talking about rapid response forces that either through drone technology or through an eye in the sky or through a satellite system would follow that train as it takes off from... Well, I, I, we, we can safely assume that uh, for government to come to that decision, some things must have been put in place. It is, uh, we can also assume that security is uh, a public matter, but at a certain level, it has to be secret. Uh, maybe, maybe. Uh, some of these uh, security installations have been done, but they can't speak about them public. Whatever the case is, let us say we are safer if those things are in place. So we take uh, the last um, headline here. This one says, terrorists reportedly abduct 30 commuters on Abuja Kaduna Highway. This happened yesterday in the Qatari area of Kaduna State around 4.30 p.m. Several commuters were reportedly shot by the terrorists during the abduction. Ah. Dr. Noel, on Monday, federal government says we are resuming services on the Abuja Kaduna train. On Tuesday, the terrorists abduct 30 people. Could this be a statement? Uh, I, I, I see it as um, opportunistic attacks by people who know that the security apparatus is at its weakest now. Now, if there was uh, the security apparatus, believe me, is made up of intelligence, capacity to respond, and willingness to respond. Now, um, as I say in Pigeon, thief no be witch, thief no be spirit. For that thing to happen on the road, those people would have aggregated around an area, decided to attack, attacked and gotten away. What was our response? So far, we've not done very well. And you know, the thing is, what, why this is particularly painful is that when governments are elected on the, on the platform and on the base of several promises of which security is one of them full employment is another hmm? then you expect at least minimum delivery on those two and on those two and that the indicators the indicators for this full employment is a drop in the number of people who are unemployed a drop in the level of hopelessness back to sdg1 uh, dealing with poverty, zero, uh, push the nearer to zero. Now, the other part of indicator of it is that with the security apparatus that people can travel in safety and get to their place of destination in safety. Now, that is like another country now. I remember in the 80s and 90s, I, you could leave Abuja, the, the, the famous way of traveling to the east of my village was called night flight. You left Abuja at about 8 in the night on these luxurious buses and you got to where in the morning, very fresh. And so you met them in the village, ah, but when you come and you rode on the night bus and nothing happened, nothing. Now you can't even travel in the afternoon. At 4.30 p.m., what do terrorists look, look for? Opportunity, a window, and a getaway possibility. That's, a, that's what they look for. And once we create that opportunity for them, and how do we create that opportunity? If they suspect that we are slack. If they suspect that our response time is slow. If they suspect that whatever happens will go back to business as usual. It's very worrying. When the train attack happened, I say, so I say to some people, don't be surprised that when these fellows are going to move back to the roads. Now, if I started a church, I would be doing very well because it means that I have a gift of prophecy. <laughs> <laughs> if you start a church, I'll talk about you. <laughs> okay, I think... Uh, that's uh, a very good point at which uh, we should uh, leave it. 
so we will take a break and uh, when we come back we will go right into the topic of the day stay with us Thank you for staying tuned to Radio Maria 91.3 FM. You have been listening to Side by Side. And now we shall begin our discussion on promoting tolerance in our educational institutions. Promoting tolerance in our educational institutions. And I would like to welcome uh, Chiedu Ude. He is uh, in the studio. Chiedu, welcome. Uh, good morning, Father. Good morning, uh, listeners, and our guest, Dr. Noel Yebozo, and then Professor Bill, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay. Um, was killed by her fellow students, people she lived with, studied with, had the same classes with. They turned into a mob suddenly and killed her. As educators, how do, you make, how do you make sense of the fact that all of this happened in the center of education? There is something called schoolmate. We all, a good number of us, pass through schools. Schoolmate. This is supposed to be a blessing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. yes. Shouldn't being someone's schoolmate or classmate or someone you call a fellow alumni, shouldn't be something we take advantage of. It should be a privilege, uh, it should be a privilege, I mean, it should offer us some privilege status, connection, solidarity, and the likes. Isn't there a sense in which the mother of Deborah, by her schoolmates, those she slept with, dined with, Open the logic of being what we have come to actually accept as schoolmate a blessing. Professor, how do you respond to this? Thank you. Um, uh, looking at it, if you look at the concept of um, education, the idea is uh, uh, we have formal, we have uh, informal, and then we also have uh, the non-formal uh, education. Now, the setting of uh, this highly unfortunate uh, occurrence is the formal sector. All of them are there acquiring knowledge and there are people there imparting knowledge. The idea of uh, an educational institution is for people to be refined. After acquiring knowledge, it affects your mindset, changes your attitude, and also improves your life. So we are somehow uh, worried that uh, students who are supposed to tell us by their attitude, by their way of life, that they have uh, uh, inculcated a lot of positive uh, uh, traits, values, and attitude are the ones who got together and um, uh, just uh, uh, visited jungle justice on this young lady. The, the idea of education, like I said, is to improve a personal development of individuals. And when individuals' attitudes improve, it also enhances productivity in the society. But with this one now, we don't know. It appears as if people just occupy the position. They occupy the, the vacancies, the vacant positions in the schools. They don't know what they are doing. They have no focus, uh, no foresight, nothing, no plans for the future. Because if people have been doing things a particular way for 50 years, and you notice that things are not changing, the best thing is to sit down, re-strategize, and see how you can improve on these things. We have laws in the land, and uh, we expect that particularly the educated ones will be the ones that will say, let the law take its course. But then, that is not what we are seeing here. The values are not there. And um, 
a lot of uh, a lot of uh, activities going on uh, on uh, the campuses, particularly in this instance now, shows that um, something is wrong somewhere. Yeah, values actually make the character. And then in education, we say in education, or most times uh, in graduation ceremonies, you hear found worthy in character and, and the learning. learning. That appears not to be happening here. Uh, Dr. Noel. I, yep. I, I, want to, I want to actually um, take off on that, the, to, the issue you've raised, the value thing, mm -hmm. because that's the whole core of education. It's not about skills, it's not because skills can be mechanistic. It's about values. What do you do with that skill? And good education is the one that inculcates values. And there are some eternal values. Respect for one another. Respect for human life. Respect for the other's opinion. Respect for self. Respect for elders. Respect for truth. Respect for decency. These are all values that a good education should underskirt. Underskirt. Now, but it is not there. This what has happened has shown that who's these students who did this act who, who did this act clearly have gone to school, but they've not picked up any real values. And one of the greatest values education teaches you is a virtue of tolerance. Is a virtue of tolerance. You must learn to tolerate the other. But sadly. You find that within our community, the whole schoolmate thing, which used to create a social network of like-minded people, or people you could trust and give your life and even be, feel most comfortable with, is gone. What we now have is a system where everybody is so intolerant of dissenting voices and any dissenting voice means the person doesn't like me. And because he doesn't like me, I should do away with him or her. And no, that's, that's, not, that's, not, that's not proper. And indeed, right now, I'm, I'm, I'm inclined to thinking that whereas we looked at COVID initially as an, as an epidemic and then later it became a pandemic, intolerance is the latest pandemic in Nigeria. Is, is the latest pandemic because nobody cares for the other. You must have your way at all means. And that intolerance is not just at the level of gruesome mothers. You find it is, is, uh, repeated in, at the level of our individual psyches and communal psyches. Let us cheat them. But cheating is not there. Cheating is wrong. Let us take it because we are stronger than them. But that is wrong. A system where people are ruled by the law of might fails ultimately because there'll be somebody stronger than you down the road. Someday. Someday. So you cannot kick it down. So in, this, in the end, values are about, what, is it right? And can I stand up for the right? And to recognize that tolerance means that as there is truth, there is a multiplicity of views and ways to that truth. And that nobody has that monopoly. And what is sad is that these core values are now be, are now totally missing from the school curriculum, and it's sad. Yeah, uh, it, yeah. Intolerance toxifies the environment. Yes, it does. Now, we hear something like this: Mrs. Alheri Emmanuel, Deborah's mother, has said some things about the loss of her daughter. She repeat, she reportedly said. What has happened to me is my cross, and I will surely, surely carry it, but none of my seven surviving children will go to school again. On what she wanted from the government, she simply said, I don't want anything from the government. In fact, the family is not expecting anything from the government. Almighty God will take control, end of quote. Now, uh, President Biden visited a Buffalo community yesterday, and then remarkably he said, "Why supremacy is poison." I quote, "Poison," which means it's 
it creates a toxic environment. Having listened to Deborah's mother, you can see what toxicity can do. If I may ask, how do we begin to detoxify the, our communities, our schools, our workplaces? Because it's sure we go a long way in helping us accommodate views that we ordinarily would not accept. Professor, what's your view on this? Thank you. Um, looking at what the woman said, um, you could see that her heart is filled with grief. You could also see that uh, probably she has no uh, confidence in the judicial system in the country because she says she doesn't want anything from government. Apparently, uh, let me say, she, she believes that she cannot get justice. Then, uh, looking at what the uh, state government is uh, bringing out now, and what the senior advocate of Nigeria said, uh, we can begin to understand why the woman said what she did, what she said. And um, by the time we, we examine it, we know that uh, it's, it's not uh, a good thing for, uh, for a woman to say that uh, none of her other children will go to school. We know the situation of uh, women education in the North. We know how serious it is. It is becoming, uh, almost becoming an epidemic. And then this woman has said this because of what she had to pass through. Um, it is not good, not for anybody, even in the South, it is not good. And then uh, by the time we, we examine everything, um, government should do something because the woman has already concluded that she cannot get justice from government. This government is there to protect your life to protect lives and property. And now you are saying you don't want anything from them because you know you will not get anything. It is not a good one. I think we need to look at it. We need to examine this properly and see how we can uh, see, we how, see how we can help uh, uh, bring out certain things that can be useful. Yeah, yeah now uh, also I've been on strike for months but there's a more powerful message from this mob action. This woman has taken a decision to take, keep her kids away from school, an involuntary, or rather voluntary action taken from something, um, one, um, so, something uh, an action or an event that shouldn't be seen happening in our citadels of learning. Uh, it, it, it's not just this woman. Mm. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it's safe to assume that there are some people who will now be scared of sending their children to schools in those places. Mm -hmm. There are also people who might be mm -hmm. thinking of withdrawing their children from, from schools, schools in those places. Mm -hmm. You remember because of Boko Haram kidnapping and others, mm -hmm. many people from southern Nigeria now are afraid of going on youth service mm -hmm. in places where there is insecurity. Mm -hmm. With the case of Borono Naomi, Goni, whose life is under threat now, you'll find a situation whereby many people will shy away from studying in places like that. But it is even much deeper than that. Uh, in order to use education to promote unity and tolerance, the federal government created unity schools. Things like this are going to make the aims of those unity schools to be defeated. 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 Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think that uh, Chedo asked a very, and that's a very important question. Uh, intolerance uh, uh, makes an environment toxic. And the question is that how can we detoxify that type of environment? And I think that well, this is an opportunity for us to sit down and think and find how we can strengthen the component of values education all through the length and breadth of our school curricula. Because we need a values education that recognizes that you don't have the monopoly 
of truth and of views. And that, um, that, that different people may are entitled to different opinions. And the fact that somebody holds a different opinion from you does not confer on you the right to sentence that person to death. And I think this is what's happening. We need to seriously do that and free the education system. I mean, we have to have an education system that moves people away from what Chimamanda Adichie called the single danger of a single, single story. story. <laughs> single story. Yes. We need to. We need to find out. And there's this very famous uh, philosopher of the, of, the, of, of the left, who is late now, his name is Herbert Marcus, who said that the greatest irony in life is an educational system that produces what he called one-dimensional men. Mm. And you don't need to go very far to see that even when we're even in nursery school, that our nurse, one of our nursery rhymes tells us the danger of one-dimensional thinking. The six blind men of Hindustan who went to the zoo to see an elephant. And one said, oh my goodness, the elephant is just like a trunk. Oh, the elephant is like a fan. And each person held on very strenuously to his views, even though the correct position of the elephant is a composite of their six perceptions. Now, what means that you have to be willing and open to divergent views. So because, like Dolly Parton would say, a coat of many colors, colors. enriches. I mean, when you now reduce the other person who's the other view, to the other, because there's a concept in sociology known as otherness. When you reduce him to the other, the other now means that you can inv you can inflict violence on him, yeah. and that's that's that that's what we should move our education system to. Yeah, listen, so we'll take a short break now, and then uh, when we come back, we will continue with our discussion of today's topic. Uh, stay tuned. You have been listening to Side by Side. And now we'll continue our discussion on today's topic, promoting tolerance in our educational institutions. Again, our guests are Professor Abiyoye and Dr. Ihe Bozo. Um, let's us, let us take a look at the purpose of education. Education is meant to shape our perception, behavior, and character. And given the fact that what happened to Deborah has happened in other institutions of learning, we should be worried that there might be gaps in the way the business of education is being carried out today. Could this be a signal to some deficiency in the system? Now, Prof, globally, the education institution is supposed to be an attraction of global talents. All across the world, institutions struggle the fight to attract global talents. Events like this rather diminish our ability or the attraction of our institutions to attract talents that make institutions prosper. Prof, what is your take on this? Mm. Uh, I agree with you. And um, I want to point out that uh, it didn't just start with the educational institutions. I believe it started from the home, the family, where the child grew up, and uh, parents give it, the child the impression that other people's uh, opinions don't matter. It starts like that. And then the child grows up the, with that impression. I am, I'm the only one that is right, no other person. The child grows up intolerant. He does not care about other people. Um, uh, Achebe, Chino Achebe said, when you are looking at a masquerade dancing, you don't stand in one position. When you say this person is wrong, you have to look at the one that is right too, so that you can weigh both, and then you can make informed decisions. But uh, this thing starts from the home, it gets to the school, maybe not even formal education. And then uh, the child is also, I don't want to say indoctrinated, or given the impression that uh, uh, he should not tolerate other people's views. Uh, as far as uh, religion is concerned, 
I want to say that it is good to respect other people's opinions, particularly concerning religion. What I hold sacred, I don't know whether somebody else does. And uh, we are entitled to our own opinion. Each person has a right, what they call fundamental human rights. So we have the fundamental human rights to believe in whoever and whatever we want to believe. But then when the child is given the impression that other people don't matter, that is how the child grows up. And uh, it, it comes back to values. The values you teach the children, you are telling them that it is only their opinion that matters. And that is how they get to the higher institution. This is a college of education. These are supposed to be teachers in training. What are they going to teach the children? And then how are they going to behave how are they going to interact when they get outside the shores of Nigeria? Are they going to still continue to uh, uh, be lawless? I don't know. But then what we are trying to say here is that uh, right from home, parents should train their children to be tolerant. Train the children to accept other people's opinions. Yes, you have stated it fine, simple just like uh, all the other institutions and groups are saying that uh, they should allow justice to take its course and so what what uh, 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 in addition to all this we know there are statutory bodies in the institutions that are meant you know to uh, uh, take care of law and order or whatever i think we should also uh, uh, enlist maybe advocacy groups, religious leaders, religious leaders that are law abiding, religious leaders that respect the laws of the land. So these ones will help us to uh, further uh, uh, educate the, the students, because all of them now, uh, all of uh, the students, and teach religious tolerance. Okay, um, uh, um, Chiodo mentioned gaps uh, in our educational system. Mm -hmm. uh, I just want to share a story. My experience at the uh, Turkish Nile University then, mm -hmm. uh, when I was running my postgraduate uh, program there. So if you enter the now Nile University of Nigeria, you are greeted by a place of worship. It is a mosque. Uh, I haven't been there in a while, so I don't know whether there is a chapel where Christians can worship. But while I was there, it was only a mosque. Now, that is supposed to be a secular institution. I don't think it is a religious institution by any means. So, if in a secular institution, you have a place of worship for one faith, and you don't have a place of worship for another faith. Isn't that a gap? And I say this because if the place is owned by a religious body for a particular religious purpose, let's say a Catholic school, you know that, yes, they want to provide education for Catholics. Or let us say Islamia, you know they want to provide education for Muslims, right? Yes. If I decide to send my son to Islamia to study Arabic and study the Quran, he will go there and I know he has to pray in a mosque only. But how about secular institutions? And we have quite a number of universities in Nigeria that are supposed to be what? Secular institutions, whether it is in the north or in the south, where it seems systemically we have not ensured that there is tolerance. I think it's a big statement of tolerance on campuses of learning, if you balance that up. What do you think? Yeah, I think one, one basic way to do this is to say, in all sec within the campus of all secular institutions, places of worship should be outside it. And you enforce it. Good. You enforce it. Because once you open the door 
and you have one in, that you can't close that tap again. More people will want to start coming. And so we have to find a way to manage things, establishment, rules, and norms that send unfortunate messages. And the unfortunate message that you're sending by allowing one sect to open a mosque or a prayer point is to say, well, we're leaning to this side. Now, if the other ones now want to countervail, they'll be seen as challenging. Because they will say, no, you, are, you, want, you want a church because you saw a mosque. That is one. The second thing we need to do to get things right is to start even at the mindset that results in this type of thing. We've got to change that mindset that you don't have to impose a physical structure for the worship of, 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 of the excel of your faith within a secular institution. But what is happening, if you look very carefully, Father, is that in all our public places now, there is gradual accretion mm -hmm. of place of worship in public secular spaces. You go to the airport, Somebody has established a prayer ground, a prayer point, or a, a chapel. Or a chapel. No, that shouldn't be. That shouldn't be. Now, what we need to do... But if is, you do it, balance up. Yes, if you do it, balance up. Now, what we need to do is to start gradually to say, we must have a values-laden education that is focused on equity. What is good for the goose is good for the gander that is focused on rights, that human beings have rights, which can, they, need, they should be allowed to exercise in the greatest of freedoms, and that you cannot constrain those rights, and that those rights are inalienable. You cannot take it from the person. That is one. Now, the other thing you now need to do is, again, to layer up on top of that value education a series of empathy-inducing things. Empathy means wearing the other man's shoe and walking a mile in it. Because it's when you do that that you know how painful it is. But unfortunately, all our curriculum does, and Father, you forgive me. You find you got, you, you, there's, a, there's a Christian religious test in a college of education or in a university. And somebody's cheating in that exam. So what has he learned in that Christian religious curriculum? <laughs> because, mm -hmm. no, no, I'm just saying that. Now, and I'm sure that your fuller has won't come and burn me for mm -hmm. because I said this. <laughs> no, I won't. I, you know very well I won't burn you. <laughs> so, so now somebody is there, a Christian religious uh, test, and the person is colluding with another person, or he's, he or she has written the answers on his or her lap. Now, what is wrong with the system then? It's because there's no morality, there's no ethics, there's no value. Think about it this way again. The lecturer in a college of education who says if you want 70% average, the cost is 50,000 naira. Father, you don't know these things. It's called sorting in our Nigerian universities. You sort and you get the mark. You thought there's a class captain whose job it is to collect the money and hand over to the lecturer. Now, when I now pay 70000 to pass a course and I get appointed to a situation where I can control others, first of all, there's an internal angst against society. There's a corrupted value system in my mind. There's a deformed will in me. So that no matter the amount of science or, or engineering rocket science I've learned, the, my weak psyche, my deformed emotions, my weak value systems are the things I can analyze how I use them. And I'll use them for the wrong purpose. I will steal public funds. So this is the thing. We need to gradually get into our educational system a concrete set of values. And not the type of values that we... That we teach through either um, uh, civics education or this other one that uh, Colonel uh, Larry, somebody tried to do, um, um, 
Like Korea. Like Korea tried to do. Mm -hmm. where, where, where people mm -hmm. thought that values were recited values. Values are not recited values. Values are lived values. If you cannot live a value, then you've, not, you've lost everything. And part of the bane of this society, impunity. I'll, I'll tell you, I'll give you a story. I mean, and this violence, this, uh, this culture of violence all over the place. They catch you stealing, you're dead. They'll burn you alive. They catch you doing this, you're dead. But those, those things are there because our society has become so hardened, so desensitized, so inhuman, that we can afford to visit violence on those around us. And that's not proper. And education has to step in now to correct it. The militarization of discussions Oh, I think I should use that so that I don't get arrested. The, 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 the appeal to raw force mm. as the end point and as a settler for all arguments mm. is defective. Like I said, somebody who, who is stronger than you is down the road. Yeah, yeah. Um, I recall Farouk Berugi, he said that he has lost faith in humanity. Yeah. He has lost faith in humanity. Now, as we look at this topic, intolerance, as you are speaking, uh, Dr. Ihebuzo, it appears as well that what feeds these uh, behaviors is also loss of faith in institutions that should take actions when there are infractions. Now, we had a guest here two days ago who said that that Islam actually accepts that's, I mean, that's, uh, that's blasphemy. But whenever that's blasphemy, that a court of competent jurisdiction is supposed to actually try the case, establish that, yes, an infraction has happened, and then met out punishment. Now, how do we get this, our young men, be stre or rather strengthen their faith in institutions that should take actions where people feel either hurt or feel that a fraction has happened. Because actually, we have a case of loss of faith in institutions. Prof, how do you? Well, we can start by asking uh, some of these uh, religious organizations, like the uh, Islamic Lawyers Association, I know. Uh, that group also uh, uh, released uh, a statement. Such groups, uh, we could ask them to uh, uh, come in, and uh, because at least they know the law, they know the law on one hand, uh, and then they also know the the implications of certain actions mm -hmm. as far as the religion is concerned. So these people could come and sit down, like I said. Uh, uh, like an advocacy group, sit down with some of the students, maybe the leaders and everything, and then ensure that they put uh, uh, things in, pray, in place to ensure that whatever happens, there will be a process whereby people can get sick and get redressed. Because if it does not happen that way, there will be no confidence in the system. If these people are aware of the fact that, yes, the people that are in charge of this group, these people are scholars, Islamic scholars, they understand what they are doing. They also know the laws of the land, they understand the constitution. I am sure they will be able to uh, develop some uh, sort of confidence in them. Because I think, well, let me put it this way, no matter the level of provocation, it should not descend to that level. And all the religious organizations have told us that whatever the case may be, the law should take its course. So people should be encouraged to follow due process rather than taking the law into their hands. Yeah. I, 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 I'll agree. And I, I, I think uh, Ched also makes an important point that Institutions have to be strengthened, and institutions have to be credible. If the institutions have failed repeatedly, 
to live up to their, uh, their expectations of the general public, people will now say, why go to that institution for redress? Because there will be an escape route out of that. I mean, the, the, the example is the one, is the criminal compl complicity charge. The institution of the, of the legal institution mm -hmm. is actually framing a charge that can be very easily dropped and perverted. And even if you are found gu guilty for criminal <laughs> complicity, <laughs> The, penal the penalties is just it's just watery. Does it confer yeah. confer any sense of justice? Yes, that's what I'm saying. So when you now find that there's a perversion of institutional norms and rules and willingness to bend to bend institutional norms to respond to particular needs, then the whole partial impartiality of the that institution is questioned. And when people question the impartiality of a system, uh, extremists in that system would want to take advantage of it and incite people to go against mm -hmm. it. But if you know that somebody is taken to the police and that within the reasonable charge established by law, the person is charged to court and charged for the correct offense, then of course you go, you, if, there's an, if there's an infraction, you will seek justice from the police. But if you know that the police repeatedly, I'm just giving the police as an example, if you think that the police repeatedly finds a way to bend the rule, to get people off the hook, then the credibility of that police is gone. And let me say this, it's not for nothing that Lady Justice is actually drawn with blindfolded. Blind, blindfolded. It's because it doesn't matter who is there. It's a straight knife. It doesn't look at persons. It looks at facts. It looks at figures. It looks at situations. It looks at context. Okay? But if now in Nigeria, what has happened is that the, the system, lady, the lady now has one only one eye patch. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that hook. <laughs> you, it looks like this one eye patch fits in very well. <laughs> Doctor, no, no. But uh, just moving from the, 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 the truth that you have just spoken, uh, I would like to say that um, the problem of religious uh, tolerance uh, will be unjustly treated if we cast it in terms of tolerance between Muslims and Christians. It is far more than that. Let, let's look at Christianity. Among Christians, there is so much hate around. Oh, sure. One denomination against another. Uh, I remember um, we were talking about marriage, mm. right? Marriage. And uh, I had sent a letter to a particular church requesting that their member who wanted to marry a member of my church, mm -hmm. they should let me know whether we should go ahead with the marriage. We call that bands of marriage. Mm -hmm. uh, the lady went delivered this letter and came back with a message that made me almost weep. First of all, she was told that for choosing to marry a Catholic, she had chosen to go to hell. Yes. Now, this message may sound as if it's a fairy tale, but it is a lived situation we are in. So if anybody deludes themselves that the challenge of religious intolerance is merely a question of relations between Muslims and Christians, that delusion is deadly. And also, even in Islam, <laughs> there are sects within Islam. And some of them are perceived as not, or treated as not being welcome. So when we speak of religious tolerance on campuses, there is need for it even in schools that are meant for Christians. You know, sometimes when you <laughs> We are in a dire, well, it, 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 they call it dire straits, right? Mm -hmm. That's exactly where we are. Mm -hmm. And if people can engineer a change in orientation, that will go a long way. Yeah, Father, I think that, I mean, it, it would be unfair mm -hmm. if we, we reduced intolerance to religious disagreements. Good. The, 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 the core of it is that 
there are a multiplicity of multiplicity of views and multiplicity of points of view and multi and i mean father if you look at the whole thing about philosophy of science and proof of facts one method is what they call triangulation you look at it at a, at, at a piece of event from about multiple perspectives now that in itself stays tolerate different views so even the philosophy of science and the philosophy of investigation accepts that. No, it's not about between Muslims and Christians. It's about disagreements between generalizing and what I said initially that sociologists call orderness. The order is a person who is externalized. And you can deal, because you externalize him, you, uh, to use a French word, you, you shosify him, you make him a thing. And because you make him a thing, you deny him of humanity. And because you deny him of humanity, then you can kill him. You see, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a three-step process that warps your mind. He's the order. The order is evil. But then in our place here, it is safe and sound. I mean, Father, there is a, the, without mentioning names, that, there's, that in politics in Nigeria, there's a group that says, cross over this line and all your sins will be forgiven. But I won't mention the Democratic Party. No, they have no name. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Prof, you wanted to add something before we tidy up. Yes, I just wanted to say tolerance should be at all levels and from different aspects. Economy, from the economy, we look at the way we sell, you know, the way we sell things. How do we do this? A, uh, a lot of people want to make profit at the detriment of others. Let's look at it. Is it fair? And then we look at uh, po the political aspect, different aspects of life. We need to be tolerant as much as possible so that we can also be tolerated. Because the way you are thinking that somebody is not uh, so good, the same way the person is also looking at you that are no, I don't think I can have anything to do with this person. So if we can practice some level of tolerance, at least let us start from there, different aspects of life. I am sure it will help us a lot. Yeah. Thanks. I was going to just, before you uh, chair do wraps up, I was just going to say or leave our listeners with uh, something to think about. Uh, we learn tolerance from the most unexpected persons. While we talk about those we call educated, who speak about tolerance, uh, sometimes the people who are actually living out this tolerance are the common folk mm -hmm. who have not even been to the worlds of education. The aboki in the marketplace who sells uh, on a table, when he's going to, for his Jumat prayer, that is on Friday. He tells the Christian woman who sells next to her, Madam, help me watch my table when I come back. That woman is going to sell if a customer comes. And when this aboki comes back, he will give him the money. And the aboki will do the same thing. Think about that. That's tolerance. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. Yeah, we have come to the end of today's edition of Sight by Sight. I must say a big thank you to our guests, uh, Professor Taiwo Abioye, former Deputy Vice Chancellor of Covenant University, Research Professor at Lux Terra Leadership Foundation, Dr. Noel Inhebozo, former lecturer, public and social policy professional with many years of experience consulting with UNICEF, WHO, UNESCO, Institute for Peace at The Hague, and others. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Father, thank for you, having Father. us. And our listeners, thank you for joining us on the program. The next edition of Side by Side will come your way Monday, May 23 at 11 a.m. Until then, keep listening to Radio Maria 91.3 FM. I am Chiedu Ude. And I am Father Robert Achiaga. <laughs>